The family of a local teenager says she never would have left home without calling. It's praying for the best. I want my daughter home, man. And then she can't come home. I just want to know where she's at. These posters around the towns of Livermore and Jay beg anyone with information to come forward. Posters that Richard puts up every spring, never losing hope. Tell me what happened to my daughter. Just, just look me in the eyes so I can see her. An arrest in a nearly four-decade-old cold case thanks to cutting-edge DNA technology. The arrest happening exactly 39 years to the day. When Parabon Nanolabs used that sample to create 3D models of the suspected killer's face. It's heartbreaking. We miss her and we're going to find her. We're going to keep looking until we do. It's like a never-ending nightmare. It doesn't end. It keeps returning and it coming back. What if I told you a 17-year-old girl from Jay, Maine, leaves her home for a joyride, telling her older sister she'd be right back, and she brought no jacket or purse? What if I said she has not been seen or heard from for 34 years? What if I told you that the people who spent the whole day with her just before she went missing claimed that they barely knew her when questioned? What if I said despite numerous searches, a number of tips, and the resolve of a strong family fighting for justice, Kim Moreau still has not been found. Welcome back to Locating the Lost, Season 1, Episode 9, The Search for Kim Moreau. I'm Travis. I'm Jeff. And tonight we're joined by Kim Moreau's family, Richard, her father, and her two sisters, Karen and Diane, as they express the heartache they have gone through for the last 34 years to the day since their beloved Kim has gone missing. How are you guys doing? Hanging Good. in there. Yeah? Yeah. Quite, yeah. This COVID thing's quite something, ain't it? Yeah. Uh, kind of sick of hearing about I it. That's easy. The COVID thing's easy. Dealing with cancer on top of the COVID thing, that's hor- what's worse. Oh. Yeah, my husband's come down with cancer, so. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. That's all bad. That. Yes, it is. If it, was, if it wasn't for that, I think everything would be normal in life. Right. No, it's normal. Almost. Yeah, but I I can heal, handle staying home. I just can't deal with going all this other stuff. Right. So how's everybody over there? Uh, we're surviving, I think. I'm still Good. working, so. Oh, no, okay. Wow. I I get to go to work fifty something hours a week, so. See the public. Well, that's good. Now, no, Richard, you met Jeff at the um oh, in Augusta at the missing, um, luncheon that you did. A couple years ago, I think. Um, yeah, it was pretty brief, I think. So his name's Jeff Atwood. Uh, for the other two, yep. I haven't met him yet. Yep. So, yeah. Um, so why don't you guys go ahead and introduce yourself, starting with Richard. Okay, I'm Richard Morrow. I'm Kim Morrow's father. I've turned around. I've now retired from the mill because this, this happened come next month. It'll be 34 years. For 34 years, we've continued searching for Kim, doing everything we can to try to find her and uh, get her remains home. And I'm very fortunate to have two daughters, Diane and Karen, which you'll hear from them in a minute. So, and Kim's mother is deceased. So life goes on. And we got to keep going, and we will never quit searching and trying everything we can to possibly bring Kim home. We do believe there's somebody out there that uh, has the information that would bring this all to an end, and this is why we're doing what we're doing, right? With the help of everybody else. So, yeah. In brief, that's where I'm at. I'm 77 years old. Not in the worst of health, but not in the best of health either. A lot of things I can't do today on account of uh, medical issues with my back. We're going to do what we have to do, and I've got a a number of uh, good people that's working with me and helping us out whenever, whatever it's got to be done, we get it done. Right. And I think that's why everybody's rooting on this case. You know, it's probably the most... I don't want to say famous, but the most notarized case in the state of Maine uh, due to your family's efforts and trying to 
Bind Kim. So you're here, there with Diane and Karen. So Diane, if you want to introduce yourself. Yes, Diane and Karen is here. They're sitting right here with me right now. We're all sitting uh, down at Karen's house. Nice. Hi, I'm Diane. I'm Kim's oldest sister. Uh, I moved back to Maine last year to see what we can do and hopefully we can find my sister and bring her back home. We have missed her for many, many years and we know somebody out there knows and we want them to come forward. Hi, I'm Karen and I'm the middle daughter of Dix and I'm the last family member that saw Kim the night she went missing. Me and Bob were at home when Kim came in, and you have no idea how many times I wish I could go back and do that night over again, because I would have never let her walk out the door. Yeah, I'm yeah, sure, Ansu. So, could you guys describe Kim to us? Like, uh, what was she like? What were her interests? That type of thing? Well, Kim was a typical teenager. And, uh, Kim was, as you as you see a photo, she was a very attractive young uh, young woman. Uh, she was in the cheering. She wanted to become a professional model, which she was supposedly going to be uh, doing shortly. And she had already talked with modeling agencies, and, but she was also a people person. She loved being with people. So, uh, just like any other teenager, I raised three of them all at, all at one time, so I found out in a hurry that she was no different than the others. You say yes, and it's no. You say no, it's yes, but that's the way, that's the way kids are. But she was very loving. She loved her grandparents who lived directly next door to us. And uh, she's been sadly missed through all the years. But I would say that to describe her, she didn't care for school. She never really applied herself, which I know she could have done a heck of a lot better than she did. That wasn't her thing to be in school. The only reason she was in school was for the socializing of uh, and being with all the other kids. Right? <laughs> yeah. She loved, her, she loved her sisters, she loved her mother and her grandma, uh, grandmother and grandfather. She was prim and proper and didn't like having anything out of place. Her hair had to be done just right. It didn't matter if she changed her clothes five times a day, because somebody saw that outfit already. So I quick, <laughs> I need to go home and change. <laughs> if you came to the door, and you knocked on the door, and she was the only one there, and her hair was an absolutely perfect, and her makeup and everything else, you were not going to talk to her face to face. <laughs> no way. Kim also did tap ballet and jazz when she was younger. Very active. Um, as Dad said, she was into cheering. She liked attending school dances, never had a problem with a guy looking at her because she did attract him with her blonde hair and blue eyes. She had pierced ears and just enjoyed the beach. I shared a bedroom with Kim for years and she was very into sunbathing and making sure that she did look just so. She also liked to do a lot of poetry. She wrote lots and lots of poems. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've read some of those. She's really talented. Yes, she was. She used to get into a pickle with somebody and sit down and write a poem about it. Kind of <laughs> a way to vent. And right. I've got a book that has poems that she wrote to specific people. Wow. I'm kidding. So if you can take us back to that time, um, you know, if, if there's something you want to include that happened before she actually went missing, go ahead and do that. But let's tell the story, you know, from that point. 
May 10th, 1986. It was Saturday night. She was supposed to be going to the prom, and things went wrong. Well, she had gotten an argument uh, with her boyfriend a few days before, and she caught him, unfortunately, with one of her best friends. So uh, things went south from that point. She didn't go to the prom. She went out with her girlfriend that day and went down to Livermore Falls Park, and two people come by, which happens to be uh, one of her friends was Rhonda Breton, who is now deceased. She turned around, and uh, Rhonda was going out with one of the guys, and they had a brand new car, and they got in the car and went riding around all the, all day. The biggest thing that I want to stress is Kim had a tight-knit group of friends for years and years. Mm -hmm. And once she became friends with Rhonda, she really kind of got isolated. All her other friends got pushed back. And Rhonda was very controlling and wanted Kim all to herself. Oh. Now, how long has she been friendly with Rhonda? I know Rhonda lives close by to your home, right? Well, Rhonda lived just up the road from us. And really, she hadn't hooked up with her but a couple of months. I mean... Five or six months, maybe. Mm -hmm. About five or six months is what um, the length of time. And that's that's when things started changing. And we started noticing some changes in Kim and who she was hanging with and so forth. But being dumb, ignorant, not not being aware of uh, everything that was going on around, just thought that it was a grown-up phase that she was going through. Right. Kim, the previous summer, had lived away from our, the home. She had one. She was working in Farmington. She was working at McDonald's, and she had people up there that she could stay with. And mom and dad said, "If you want to stay up there." then go ahead. I have no problem that. If that's going to make you happy, then do it. So she yeah. lived up there for the summer. But because she was living away from us, she called home every day, more than once sometimes. Or she was visiting. Or bringing laundry home to do. You know, or something like that. But when yeah. she, you know, so even though she was not there, she was there more than she was there. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't quite seem like she moved up very much, does it? No, no, but she wanted to try it, and they were willing to let her go. So they, she's, you know, she went away for the couple of months, and then she came back. Yeah. As soon as school started again, she was right back home and right back into the school life and normal phase of life again. You know, she had just moved away for the summer and wanted to see what it was like being on her own and being able to get, it was easier for her to get to access to work. So mm -hmm. we turned around like we did with all our children. We trusted our children and uh, felt that we had brought them up to a stage where they knew right from wrong and they, and they knew that if they make the wrong decisions that there was consequences on it. And so we trusted all of them. All right, that's the most you can ask for as a parent, right? Is hoping that you taught them the difference between right and wrong and let them make their own decisions. Well, we always felt that if uh, by the time they're 12 years old, if they don't know right from wrong, they aren't going to know right from wrong. <laughs> right. Um, so so what happened on that uh, the night that she went missing, everything leading up to, the, to her actually disappearing? So me and Bob were at home. And mom and dad were up at the VFW that night. And Kim came home about 11 o'clock at night. I talked to her that evening. She said that she was going back out for a ride, would be home in about an hour. I honestly had no reason to think that was going to be the last time we ever saw Kim. How would she describe her mood when she saw you that night? She, she was happy. You know, people talk about drugs involved and so forth. 
Kim was not slurring her words. She did not scared or upset. It was a night like every other night. Mm -hmm. I mean, she came in, talked to me, grabbed a couple of things, and left. I mean, that there was no triggers for me to say, what's wrong, stay home, don't go. Right. There was nothing like that. You know, when I first heard about Kim's story and heard that um, Richard and his wife was at the VFW, I had no idea until I met with Richard a couple years ago that the VFW was literally across the street from your home. Exactly. And can I also stress, when Kim left that night, she had no purse. She didn't take money. She had a car sitting in the driveway that my parents had bought. If she was going to run away, she would have taken clothes. She would have taken a jacket. Mm. She would have taken money. So what, what was the stuff she came to collect that night? I think she came in to use the bathroom. Isn't that why she actually came home, Karen? I believe so, yes. She came in, went pee. A couple of things, too. Uh, both uh, me and my wife, uh, we were at the VF. I was chairman of a, on a committee, and it was the night that they were having the big supper and the dance and all of that. And afterwards, uh, I was helping my wife behind the bar because she she was a bartender up there at that time. And we were up there working and uh, we worked until one o'clock. Well, we never got home until almost two o'clock in the morning. Right. So it's a thing where, uh, like I said, we trusted our children. So. so when you got home at two o'clock in the morning, did you know then that she was still out or... Did you not know until the yes. next morning? We knew she was out. We knew that was strange because uh, that was not Kim. So we turned around and made uh, made some coffee, sat down, and my wife and I were talking. And we turned around and sat there. And then when it got to be almost 5 o'clock in the morning, we knew definitely something was wrong. Right. So we went to the J Police Department to try to report her missing. And they told us that we couldn't, re we could not, they could not take a report for 48 hours, which we all know today is not, not the case, but that's the way it was. Right. So 48 hours later, we went back. But in the meantime, we were on the phone talking with everybody that uh, we could possibly think of to see if anybody had seen Kim and nobody had seen Kim. Now, what goes through your mind when you're in this situation? You, I mean, I'm sure it's just spinning. Fear. Mm -hmm. The one thing, the one thing that, the one thing that we had, I can honestly say is, is that we felt in this situation that the police was our biggest ally that we had on our side, and it turned out that it wasn't for many reasons that we found out down the road later on. Right. For the next two days, uh, we, we, all of us, were trying to come up with a name that we could possibly contact to find out where the heck Kim was, and we couldn't find we couldn't find nothing. So finally, we we went back on the 48th hour, which was about five o'clock in the morning. We went back on Monday morning to report her missing. And then I got in an argument with them up there because they they tried to tell me it hadn't been 48 hours. I said, don't give me that crap. We were here at 5 o'clock in the morning. We're here now. Right. <laughs> and I uh, made them at that point take a deposition, and we brought up everything that we thought was relevant at that point, and uh, we turned around and get them to at least do that now I know they I know they did call the sheriff's department 
to report her so she would have ended up on the NCIC computer, but they had a lot of things going on. And somehow somebody wrote it down and it got shuffled in underneath the papers and she never did get reported as being missing or possibly endangered for four months. Holy cow. Jay police obviously never followed up and looked either because if they had, they would have seen that. And in the meantime, our family was going absolutely bonkers. We, meaning me and Diane, knew a lot of the people that Kim hung out with. We kept riding around, talking to people, asking for help, begging people to keep an eye open and right. let us know if we saw her anything. I mean, she just plain vanished off the <clears throat> face of the earth and nobody was willing to talk. I can remember being at work and them, my boss at work telling me, get off the phone. And I said, no, no, I'm not getting off the phone. She says, you need to get off the phone and get back to work. I said, I'm trying to find my sister. Right. And she said, you know, you need to get off the phone and go back to work. And I was calling Calvin Tidswell and asking him if he knew anything about her. So you what know, did he say? We, were, we called, he said that he had no idea where she was or anything else. Let us let the uh, listeners know who Calvin is. Calvin Tidswell is a gentleman that lives in Livermore Falls, where he did at the time. Um, his parents owned a nice little place in Livermore, and he, the Calvin, has been through many, many things. He was a very, very bad person. Um, he left somebody to die on the side of the road that was in an accident. Her name was Cindy Fournier. He took a chunk out of a game warden's face that he was fighting with. He bit the person. He spent many years in jail for doing different types of, or selling different types of drugs. Wow. Um, and he just always got away with everything. Now, was he an acquaintance of Kim's? Was, was he uh, supposedly with her that night? He ended up seeing her that night, what they call on the monkey bridge in Jay. And he ended up talking. He, she knew who he was because the guy that she was dating was friends with him at the time. Okay. So that's how he comes into the picture. <clears throat> so he owned the arcade right near the school, right? Um, yes. yes. And the yes, rumor is that he was supplying drugs to the kids in exchange for other yeah. things? That's the rumor. That's the rumor. Did you ever reach out to uh, Rhonda Breton? Like within those first 48 hours? Many, many times. Did she not answer Rhonda, her phone or what did she have to say? Rhonda was very unwilling to help. In fact, when interviewed with police, she changed her story multiple times. I've always believed in my heart that Rhonda knew exactly what happened that night and she could have ended it all. And in my opinion, Karma came back and got her because Rhonda moved to California and was eventually killed by a hit-and-run driver. And to my knowledge, her case has never been solved. Oh, wow. So she was supposedly a, a, a close friend of Kim's, right, for those couple months after they, they'd met? Yes. It, I have yes. notes that say that Rhonda was a good friend of Kim's. I mean, Kim wrote notes, you're my best friend and that kind of stuff. Right. But when police asked Rhonda, Rhonda tried to say, I hardly know her. And they were like, they were very much together. If you weren't in school, Rhonda wanted to know where Kim was at all times. And that right. wasn't the case. I mean, Rhonda was good friends with Kim, but wouldn't admit it. So she was distancing herself from Kim. Yeah, we turned around, and a couple of days after Kim had disappeared, there was a party just down the street, and she was over there. And we walked up to we walked up to the uh, party, and she see us, and she turned around and started saying she didn't know nothing, and they weren't friends. They weren't that good of friends, and all of this stuff. And I actually played tag with her one time at, at the grocery store. I happened to walk in and see her. 
So I went to approach her. She turned around and she reversed her direction, went up and went into the next aisle. I go over to the next aisle. I I turned around and came back the opposite way, and I came back in the aisle. We did this three different times. Oh, geez. Finally, I walked up to her and I says, what's the matter? Can't you even turn around and talk to us anymore? Yeah, that seems extremely suspicious. She left the cat right there and left the store. Wow. It wasn't very long. It wasn't very long after graduation that she was gone out of the state. As soon as she graduated, she left. Who did Kim go out with that night when she came home? Was there any conclusion to that? Like, does anyone actually know 100% who she came home? Uh, she went out uh, with Brian Edmonds that night, and the other individual in the car was Darren Jogri. And Rhonda. Okay. And Rhonda. The four of them were spent the entire day together. Okay. Darren had got a new car, and they were riding around, and I don't know, speculation. Right. So, but but they were seen throughout the day together, the four of them, right? And it's that's the assumption is that they were still together when she came home to to use the, the restroom. Yes. My okay. understanding is is that Brian was there with Rhonda, but not Darren. It's been said for years that Darren Jodery was working at the mill in Rumford, and supposedly he had the evening shift. But the problem is a lot of people that worked at the mill said that they used to punch each other's time cards, and that was a very common oh, thing okay. that happened at the time. We know, we know for a fact because Detective Pickett, who ended up taking the case, actually checked that out, and there was a time card for him that night. It showed him. Uh, clocking in at 10.20 and clocking out at 6.20 in the morning. Do you know if anyone actually confirmed seeing him that night or probably this time it was... That I can't tell you. Yeah. I wouldn't... If I told you anything on that, I'd be I'd be just uh, taking it off the top of my head. Right. So, detectives must have interviewed Darren, right? Or, I mean, uh, Brian. Yeah. Brian they, have, they have interviewed Brian. They have in, interviewed uh, Darren as well. Both so, have taken lie detector tests. The two guys that were in the cab with them all day. Right. Yeah. And both of them have taken lie detector tests, and my understanding is that both of them flunked. Can I comment something, please? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, absolutely. When Kim went missing, me and Bob went down in town. And we actually found Darren. And Bob pulled up beside his car, and we rolled down the window and started talking to him and said, I wanted to know where my sister was. And he's like, I don't know your sister. And it's like, oh, yes, you do. You were with her on Saturday night, and she was with Rhonda. And right. it's like, right away, we got... Oh, was that her name? Even to this day, that's always bothered me because it seems so past tense. Was that her name? Right. right. It, it struck me funny, and let's just say he wouldn't talk anymore once he figured out that he did know her. The car started up, and he went squealing out of the parking lot, and wanted nothing to do with us anymore he wouldn't talk to us no he's the one that had the white was it a white trans am correct now sure. what did they find when they looked in that white trans am nothing and why is that my understanding was it never got looked at forensically for like 18 years 17, or something on her 17th anniversary the guy was brought into augusta and my and the reason I was told that it took that long is that they couldn't find out who the heck had the car. I says, wait a minute, you people, and I was talking with state detective at the time. I says, you mean to say you have an automotive bureau and you can't tell me who owns that car today? Right. I said, that, that seems awful goddamn uh, numb to me. You, you ought to be able to look up a doggone ID number. Right. And come to find out the car was owned by a lieutenant. I believe he was a lieutenant, either a sergeant or lieutenant, up in Rumford, and he worked for the Rumford Police Department. 
Well, isn't that convenient? Yeah. But they couldn't find the car. Yeah, they couldn't find the car until after we said that. And two weeks later, guess what? They were taking the car in to have forensics run on it. Well, 17 years later, it's pretty hard to get any evidence out of it. Exactly. Right. Poor police work. Well, poor police one. work also means right from the start, my family was trying to get Kim's name put in the paper, anything on TV, any kind of publicity to have the public help. And the J Police Department kept telling everybody that Kim was a runaway, that she wasn't in danger, and there was nothing to worry about, basically. We didn't need any help. And um, then they, they were also saying that she had done it previously. And exactly. that, that was referring to the year before when she was living up in Farmington and spent most of her time at home. Oh, so they were, they were taking that as, uh, as she'd <clears throat> run away previously. Yeah, she was spending most of her time at home and calling saying. every day. Correct. Wow. You would think, and I think they do a better job nowadays, but you'd think they would want to presume the worst. Bad. Can I also let you know that at the time Ronald Reagan was president, um, my mom was dying of cancer. My sister was missing. Life was pure hell. And they sat down and wrote a letter to President Reagan that, I know we still have copies of that said my daughter's missing, we need help. And Reagan had a letter sent back stating, I can't help you, but good luck with the search for Kim. Wow. And at the time, and remembering one other thing, my wife is going through cancer at that time with her daughter missing. And I'm working at the mill and I'm working swing shifts at the mill. And we're trying to get all the help that we can to uh, get things going. There were several searches that got organized with people here in town, and we did a search. How well the, the search was done is unless uh, her body was up on the ground or it was a very freshly dug grave, nobody seen it. Mm -hmm. But we were also, there was the other side of it. We had the whole cancer thing going on, and then... We're trying to get the help for Kim and uh, every phone call we we are making, and this is 1986. We were we were spending anywhere from 600 to 1,000 dollars a month trying to find Kim on top of paying for uh, the cancer. Wow. Because back then it wasn't free. Everything cost money when you called different towns. Right. When you call, it when, was toll calls. When we called right. Farmington, it was a toll call. And the additional stress, I've always said, the additional stress of what was going on, because up to the time Kim disappeared, uh, my wife was doing very well. After she disappeared, she started going the other way, and in less than two years, well, it was two years and 12 days to the day that she actually died. So we've, we've been through... A heck of a lot of, uh, there's been a heck of a lot that's gone on. We have done countless numbers of searches. We have had uh, the dogs out, I don't know how many times, but we're willing to follow up on uh, anything that anybody give us. Somebody's right. going to get an answer. And they, I could probably give you four or five names, but I'd be guessing at them. But I can tell you that Darren as well as I believe Kelvin, as well as I believe uh, Brian Edmonds could tell us today what happened and where she is. Although I do not believe that Kelvin was directly involved in what happened. I think he was in that, he was secondary. He came in the following day. To help possibly clean up or fix the situation. Yeah, to clean up. I think uh, when it came time to, they told, I think they told uh, uh, Calvin what happened, where they buried him, and Calvin says they're going to find her there, and Calvin turned around and found another place for him. Mm. And I think that's how Calvin gets involved. Now, what about her boyfriend that she had broken up with, Mike Staples? I mean, that would be kind of a motive if, if he and her are fighting. Is there any talk of him possibly being the one involved? 
Oh, I've sat and I've talked to, I talked to Mike Staples for 10 hours one day. Oh, wow. And according to him, he didn't know a thing that went on. Did he but take a it, lie detector test? That I can't tell you. I can tell you, though, that Mike never called the house questioning anything about Kim. What do you mean by that? Meaning that after she went missing, I don't know about you, but if I was dating somebody mm -hmm. and they all of a sudden went missing. I want to know where they are. I've right. touched with the family from time to time. Maybe not every day, by no means. Let's see if there are any updates um, or something, though, right? Or know, be involved and help. Well, considering exactly. considering Kim had Mike's ring, class ring. And as far as we know, still does. No, he Jumping had her up, class ring, Jumping right? it up with Kim's ring. Which, to me, sounds like a souvenir. Well, me and Bob went and saw Mike. And Which Mike we was, now have. Mike was actually in a swimming pool, and I was pretty pregnant. And we started asking for Kim's class ring, saying it's my sister's, and I don't have my sister. I want a ring. Right. And he was swimming, and, you know, big grin on his face. I lost it. I was so pissed off. I wanted to go drown him in that pool, let's just say. And <laughs> years later, we found out that he actually traded that for $10 so that he could go get a bottle of alcohol and he gave the ring to Calvin. Which, why would Calvin want it? That's wow. That's weird to me. Cal Calvin, Calvin had it. Calvin had it because he got the booze for Mike Staples and that was a trade. No, I know that. I'm just, I'm curious as to why, why would he want it? It's just odd to me. Calvin? Yeah. Well, he, he's right. a sadistic. He was sadistic back then. While he was in prison, he told the cop, go to my mother's home, open up a cupboard. It's in a can up on a shelf. Third shelf. And they did it. And sure enough, there was the ring right in that container, just as he said. Wow. It's right in the and now you guys have it, right? What did you say? I said you guys have that ring now, right? Dad has I do. It. Yeah. Are uh, are those are those three men still alive? Yes, all three of them. Uh, in fact, I talked to about uh, three couple months, months ago. ago. A couple months ago. You spoke to Calvin. Sure. Yes. He lives down in Poland. What did What did you guys talk about a couple months ago? Oh, we talked to him, just reviewing everything that went on that day and so forth. That uh, we had heard that he had had an argument with Kim and so forth and according to him uh oh no that is that's all fictitious so Mike, and to hear him if he could solve the case that he'd do it immediately and so forth and then i heard that well once the case gets solved he'll fill in details huh. so we gotta dig up all the information right so he's a lot of help yeah it's oh, kind yeah. of hard to do when the people who know something aren't talking about it right <laughs> So I know, We've been fighting um, for years and years. It, so, it's also hard, too, when Jay Police should have been all over it. And obviously, the best time to find somebody who's missing is right in the beginning. And they kept deterring more and more efforts by saying she was a runaway. And we didn't even get state police involved for months. State police became involved in September was late August or early September they became involved and the only reason they became involved is we had called the governor and we had called our representatives, senators and everybody else and finally we actually got told that when the detective came down, the day he came down, it was he was coming down to appease us because he felt he was coming down to have a cup of coffee, get up and walk out. Well, he never left for 12 hours later. Holy cow. And that's when she got reported, uh, she got reported missing on the NCIC computer. And that's when the state police took it over. But you got to remember one thing, in order for the state police to get involved, the town of Jay had to release the case to the state. And at the time, Earl Lynn Farrington was chief of police in Jay. 
and I hope every single night that Kim haunts him. I really do because that bastard stopped my family from finding my sister. Right, yes. So I'm sure. I hope he goes by all the faces on the telephone poles and realizes what he did to my family. And he was not chief of police for very long. He actually got done, and oh, yeah. Chief White took over after Ren. Things changed. After Things changed. Chief, Chief White took. Speaking of those posters on the uh, on the telephone poles and such, I read somewhere that you've put up over fifty thousand of those over the years. Yeah, it's much it's much higher than that because I also worked at the mill, and one of the one of my jobs was uh, I control the shipping area, so every load of paper that went out had one of Kim's posters in it. Oh wow! We have, confirmed, we have them confirmed from Greece, South America, uh, China, over in Japan, Formosa. Wow! We have them literally all through Europe. We have them confirmed from all over, all over the world. So she went out all over the world. So I grew up uh, about twenty minutes from you guys uh, in Leeds. And I remember I was twelve years old at the time yeah. when. When Kim went missing, I was 12, and I remember seeing those posters. You had gone all the way out to there to put posters up. Yes. She was the first children. time that it hit home to me that people were taking kids or taking people. Yeah, I'll continue putting the posters up as long as I can physically. Either that or she comes home, and then I'll go around tear it tear every poster down. The other thing I want to say is when this all happened, it really changed a lot of people because Kim was afraid of the dark. So the idea that anybody ever left Kim at the bottom of Jewel Street to walk home, Kim had no coat on and she would have never walked that far. I want you to know that she had good friends that lived only a couple houses down from us. They used to go out by the side of the road. They would wait until each person got in front of their house and say goodnight and run in. Yeah. And it was also 39 degrees and she's only wearing a little cotton blouse, right. short sleeves. Don't so let's, make any sense. So let's talk about that. Now, I know Brian had a couple different stories, right? He changed story several times. What were some of the stories he had said? Three times I know of. Brian said that at first that they had consensual sex. That's what he's, and he stressed consensual. Mm -hmm. But he didn't say that for years. That didn't happen immediately. That didn't happen until probably two years out, but. He turned around and said that they had consensual sex up on what is known as Piss Hill, which was a hangout for teenagers at the time. Then he he said afterwards he dropped it down by the park by Livermore Falls. Then he turned around and changed it that he, uh, again, that they had had consensual sex, but they dropped her off down by the police station down there at the ball field down there. And then the third story that he had is he dropped her off at quarter of one in the morning and he dropped it by the monument right there in Chisholm. Now, what and was Rhonda's the story? story? Oh, sorry. The last story was that he dropped her off at uh, around three o'clock in the morning down there and that she was very distressed about what had happened with her and her boyfriend and she wanted to walk home because she wanted to think about it. Mm. Well, there's four stories. Which one are you going to believe? Right. Rhonda also came up with a story that she got dropped off at Old Orchard Beach. We used to go to Old Orchard Beach a lot. She enjoyed it there. But we also knew that wasn't a story that we could believe because what is she going to do? Go sit on the beach for the right. rest of her life? That right. wasn't a story that was believable either, and everybody just kept changing things. It's going on 34 years. The case is still very active. Uh, we have a detective uh, that's working on it right now, uh, and uh, Larry Rose is working the case, and he is, as much as possible, he has uh, devoted time to the case. Whenever I've had some uh, important information, at least more information, 
I have given it to Larry and he has followed up and given us an, an answer. One of the biggest things that we found through the case is communications absolutely stunk because we had at one while, we had one detective that had the case for almost two years and I never even seen him once. Unbelievable. So uh, that the case is still going and from everything I am told, they will continue with the case. But one of the things that hurts the case is we had a cold case squad that we uh, actually helped get funded. And they are supposed to work at the time when they were funded, it was supposed to have been detectives would work cold cases. They do not work cold cases. They work active damn cases because there's so much stuff going on. And what happened to all this money we appropriated for a cold case squad? I mean, yeah, it's paying their salaries to do something that is happening today, not 34 right. years ago, and try to help out the families to get answers and get some closure. That's as much as I can actually say about the case right now. There is some leads that's still out there, and we're following up on every, every lead that we can. But we know someone has answers, and we're just asking them, step up. It's been 34 damn years. All Bring right. the information. It may, you may not think it's important information you have, but if you step up and you give us the information, that may go along with another piece of information we have that will lead to finally bringing closure. Right. If you, if you know something, say something. And that's what I said the other day on the page. Um, do it anonymously. You know, don't your family's right. concern, if I understand, is just finding Kim. It's not even about well, necessarily justice at this point. Is getting Kim home. Right. I thought that possibly Kim's case could have been solved um, when they tore out the fruit stand in Livermore Falls. That was right in front of where Calvin used to live. And there was a cement slab that was put down. Day after she disappeared. Right after she went missing. The day after. Right. Oh, wow. And that looked pretty suspicious. Well, it was something that, that was already planned, but it would uh, have been a rather convenient thing, though, turn around and if uh, you're going to pour a cement slab this morning, to hide and her body something in. like that, it would have been an opportunity to hide a body where chances are it wouldn't have been found. Right. And point blank, we all know that Calvin prided himself on his trophies. What a perfect trophy to be able to come home every day and see that slab and know that the rest of the world doesn't think she's there. But speculation from the community was that her body was there. And over and over and over, we got stories that they believed she was going to be found there. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, didn't happen. it didn't happen. Now, that was searched um, last fall, right? They dug it up? No. no. It was done in June. 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 It was okay. done in June this, uh, this past year. All right. It's good, I guess, in a way to check that off your list of places to search. Right. right. At least exactly. you know now. It's another place that you can turn around and cross off and right. we know for the fact that uh, she, she is not there because we've had dogs up there. We've had dogs up there we've done all of that we've lifted the slab and they even lifted more of the slab uh than uh originally was intended yeah that's why i say larry rose has done larry rose is right there with us and helping us out whenever we have anything that seems credible and going forward i also want to say that missing and exploited children has really too. They, about every five years, do an upgraded age progress picture of what they believe Kim would look like now. Oh, that's nice. And I just wanted everybody to know that they are also a very good resource. And the last age progress picture that they did, they actually contacted me and wanted pictures of me and Diane to see how we had aged over the years and wanted to implement that in their newest picture of Kim. Oh, wow. Now, 
Oh, very nice. Now, is Kim's DNA on file anywhere, or...? Yes, the state has a complete DNA profile on her. Very fortunate, when my wife died, there was some blood that was still up in the in the bank at uh, Farmington Memorial, uh, Franklin Memorial, because uh, of the cancer that she had had. And when they were cleaning that out, my daughter works there, and she got in touch with the police they came up and they and they actually found some slides so we we are able to have a complete dna profile they're paraffin blocks that have her, her actual tissue in them oh wow and they took my dna and diane's dna and dad they said that they really wanted the women's because we could confirm that definitely she would be in the family and that it was there plus the fact that dna has changed over the years in their methodology so it's been collected a couple times and the fbi actually came to the house and collected it we had two agents that came in, offered their services to my family, and the state of Maine absolutely denied help and will not let them help on Kim's case. Wow. I've got a business card that I could dig out. I'm 99% certain that the last FBI agent that I spoke with was Mike McCall. I'd have to verify the name by the card, but I do have it. And unfortunately, we don't have the help because of that. Wow. One of the things that we've tried to fight in Augusta is uh, that after a certain period of time, whatever resources is available, whether it be private, federal, uh, FBI, in this case here or whatever it is that they should be allowed to come in and be able to get the case and go through it right and do it the state of maine will not allow that to happen that blows my mind they were going to put this on tv the production company that did the warden show northwoods law oh yeah wanted to come in and do a whole series just on missing people in maine there's so many missing families, families that have missing loved ones, that they thought that they could help by airing a series. And State they were Maine. shut down. They were really? shut down completely and said that if they came in and tried to do it, that they would be, uh, they would be brought to court. So they killed it. That's so absurd. Hmm. That would be Janet Mills. Yeah. She helped shut that down. Well, when it's she was Janet Mills, attorney it's general. Just the same. Attorney, uh, she was the attorney general at the time. Bill Stokes also sat down with me and dad back in 2007. I had gone before the legislative panel and voiced some opinions on what I thought was going wrong. <laughs> and we got invited in for a meeting. There was several state police there. Bill Stokes was there, and they told me that they were going to do a search looking for Kim, that they felt they knew where her body was, and that search never did get done. They told me they had enough information to obtain a war uh, warrant, and the search warrant was denied it never did happen and did they say where the location was or what they never told us the location the last search that was done there was a search done we weren't even notified the search was being done hmm. that's what wow. i said one of the things that is really wrong in the entire system is is there's no communications and families uh, have no family. rights. Families have no rights when it comes to it. State police stand right there. When we were in the judiciary uh, meeting, state police will stand right there. You go in and you say what you've got to say, and then they come back and rebut. But you cannot say a word. If you, if you open your mouth, you will be asked to leave. And they can lie right through their teeth saying how they did all of these things, and we know better. And I can get you many families in the state of Maine that will tell you the same thing. And it, in some cases, they've actually threatened people that if, if they continue 
trying to progress and uh, doing the things that they were doing, that they would turn around and their case wouldn't even be touched. Wow. So Brian Edmund they, has they, property in Canton, right? Yes. Now, it's my understanding that he worked for years to try to gain that property, and then he built a home, or is it a trailer yes. or something he's got on it? Now, they searched that property, right? Yes. Did they find and anything? Did, they didn't find anything, but the dogs keep hitting, saying there's human remains up there. Yeah. Oh, jeez. But, like it was explained to me from Dr. Ed Davin, the remains could be two, three miles away. And that's just where the water is settling, and that's where the dogs will uh, gravitate to. So okay. it could be underground water that's carrying it down. And so, and we're not saying that it's camp. I'm just saying that the dogs hit on it. Right. But they actually did ground penetrating radar over there, and they did do they did do for four days. They were there. Yeah, I remember watching it on the news and uh, seeing you there every day as well. We thought that there was a chance that it might end, but I never got my hopes up too much. I said, every day I'd, I'd be asked by some of the officers, how come you ain't more excited about this? It's going to come to an end. I says, I'll tell you what, you want to see me get excited? Come up and tell me you found something. And right. I says, our emotions have been brought up and down so many doggone times. I says, I can't allow that to happen no more. I says, to a point where I almost had a nervous breakdown over the thing. And I says, I would, I refuse to allow myself to let my emotions get that high again. You tell me you found something, I'll do handsprings for you. <laughs> I'd right. love to see that, Richard. <laughs> it's one of those things that your, your emotions get played with so much that when people ask you, they look at you and they think you're cold and calculated. But we have to put this wall up around us that right. otherwise we can't live that people don't realize. Right. Yeah. We live it every day. Our lives have been now for, come May 10th, they'll make 34 years that we have lived this doggone horror. Jeez. It's pretty sad when you can say most of your life you've been looking for somebody. Yeah. Right. So I had read somewhere that somebody theorized that Lewis Lent, the serial killer that traveled up and down the East Coast, may be involved. You you don't believe that, do you? Never heard that one before. Lewis Lent, he was a serial killer. Uh, he'd been picked up for murders in Massachusetts and uh, New Hampshire and I believe um, maybe like Delaware or something. Rhode Island, I think. But um, no, that's, a different, he, that's a different one. Okay. He did say, he did say that he had um, done something to a, he assaulted a child in Maine and it was happening the same time as when Kim disappeared, but they couldn't make any connection. Well, there was two cases that happened uh, within six months up here. Kim disappeared and another girl uh, disappeared from up in uh, Dixfield. So that's yeah, and her, thing her story is not well known at all. No. 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 Larry also, the cop on the case now made sure that we were aware of that so that if a female body was ever found don't get too hyped up that it's kim because it could also be her right they were very mm. similar in age and i believe and I she was that, last seen by a police officer right not sure i can't i couldn't tell you i can't remember we've done we've gone through so many interviews and done uh, so much talking about all these different things that's happened that i can't honestly tell you that the one that could tell you that is larry rose yeah. and larry's actually the officer on her case as well now there's also a couple guys and we're not going to say the names or anything um but that run the finding kim page i believe that's been taken down since but they've also offered a lot of help and support to your family as well right absolutely they've been uh they've been with us for over 10 years and one one has been on it since kim disappeared Oh, wow. And we're very, very fortunate to have had them because they have dug up some material that, uh, and leads that we would have never got otherwise. Oh, they definitely work hard on that case, um, on, on her case, and we you are very fortunate to have them. We appreciate every person out there who has ever done anything to help us locate Kim. We don't care 
which person it is, how many people help. All we want is for us to have a huge party with everybody at the end of this when this is all done and over with and she's finally brought back home. It would be so nice to have every person in one area and I'll say get to do a big thank you. Yeah. Right. I don't know if that would ever be possible. Uh, I don't think we have an, a stadium around big enough to do that. But that would be <laughs> we have had We have had so many people have come forward to try to help us. It must be real frustrating, too, knowing that with all these people that are coming forward to try and help, right, you know there's just there's, there's at least one person out there that just has to say something, right, that might That's all it really takes. open it all up. And they don't even need to come up. Come out and give their name and do anything. Grab a dog right. on telephone, give the exact destination, and give the exact point where you can go and find it. Don't give me that she's near a brook and there's a lot of big trees and a lot of big rocks. I can show you a right. lot of trees and big rocks and brooks and everything else around. Give me a spot. Go up this road, go here and go in so far, you're going to find this and then go over there and uh, there she is. Right. There's so something, right? We have, we have tried working with psychics and everything else and the problem is I ain't saying that they, they aren't right. I'm saying that they can't get a, give us specific enough information that you can locate what they're seeing. Right. It's frustrating Generic. for them as well as it is us. Because yeah. we still have some, uh, we still have some friends of ours that uh, we have become friends with them that are psychics, and they're still trying to work it today. Yep. So I mean, we've we've gone to I think every length that we can to get the information that we need to bring it home. So we are down to a point of begging people to please, if you've got a piece of information, either get to one of the three of us, call the main state police, call the local police, because I know the chief that's on there now, he he has worked his butt off to try to uh, get this solved. So just call somebody and let us know exactly what you've got. We'll take it from there and then follow up on it. Is there anything else you guys have to say or want to make sure you mention before we disconnect tonight? Thank you for everything you do to try to help bring Kim home. Oh, you're very welcome. Kim, yeah, absolutely not wrong. Thank you to everybody that's ever helped us. I still believe Kim cannot truly be at peace until she's found. I pray and hope that she's with my mom and her grandparents and every other family member that we've lost. But in my heart, Kim cannot be at peace until she is found. And we need to bury her properly. Nobody deserves that. No family deserves to go through what we have. Since Kim disappeared, we've lost her mother, her grandfather, her grandmother, her aunt, other grandmother, grandfather, her uh, uncle, stepmother, her uncle. uncle. Regardless so we've of had lost, the family. We have lost a lot of people since she has disappeared. I and think the thing is, the thing that gets to me is just that one action of, you know, her and Michael or Mike having an argument caused her not to go to the prom that night. Had she gone to the prom that night, we'd be talking to her, you know? It been entirely different. That's correct. Mm -hmm. She was supposed to have uh, been in the Miss Main, uh, Miss Main contest two weeks later. Oh, wow. But I didn't know that. Because she disappeared. Hmm. Oh. So we still oh. sit here today still feeling that, yes, she can be found and she can be brought home, but it's going to take some people helping somebody coming forward and saying, yes, I, I will step up to the plate and here's the information you're looking for. And I don't care if I know their name or I don't know their name. It don't make any difference. Right. Just one person needs to do the right thing. Right. That's it. Well, we commend you guys on your strength and determination. Um, you know, and that's something that's always stuck with me is just seeing you putting those posters up and driving through town and, and seeing all the posters. Uh, yeah, I'll be doing that very shortly. I haven't done them that so far, but I will be going around to them again. It's time to update them. i got to go buy more tape and do all of that, but I've got to do it very shortly. I just moved again, so I've been doing that. Well, thank you guys for uh, joining us tonight. Thank you very much. If there's anything that we can do to help support your search, you know, 
yeah, please reach out to us if there's anything we can do. Um, you know that I like making those posters, so I don't mind if you guys have some thoughts on something you want made up. I can do that too. You're awesome. Well, if you want to make up a new poster, go ahead and do it because I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be uh, doing posters again here shortly. Yeah, you saw the one where I, I put you on there, right? You're putting yeah. up one of her yeah. posters. Yep. Yeah, I'd like to get a nice picture, of, uh, just a nice picture of Kim on there and go with that. So that when you drive down the road, and I do know that black and white is the only thing that really shows. Color doesn't show up and it don't last. Right. It fades. It fades out and uh, you put them up and within six to eight weeks, you can't even tell what the heck you got. But... We appreciate everything that everybody has done to help all the media, everybody that everybody that's been out on a search or anything else. The family really appreciates them, and we want to say thank you again. Yeah, I hope hope this comes to a close for you guys sometime soon. This is I can't imagine. Well, hopefully this is a year, but we've said right. that now for thirty three years, and it hasn't happened. Yeah, these. We'll never so give gonna... up looking, though. Right. I would just like to see it all ended before I pass on so that the girls can have at least a few years before it's their time. They don't, right. deserve, they don't deserve spending more than half their lives searching for their system. Right. It's a tragic, sad story. Our hearts are with you all. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, have a good night. Yeah, thank you, guys. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Take care right. now. Bye-bye. 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 Bye. Bye. We'd like to thank Kim's family, Richard, Diane, and Karen, for taking the time tonight to speak with us about this case. If you have any more information about tonight's case, please contact the Maine State Police at 1-800-452-4664 or reach out to us on our Facebook page at Locating the Lost. And you can get updates about the case by following the Finding Kimberly Facebook page. And as always, thanks for listening. Five-year-old Taylor, Taylor Williams led investigators to Alabama this week. So we have some breaking news from Florida. An arrest has been made. Tonight, in connection after with years of agony, a glimmer of hope for the family. Investigators spent hours searching through this house off Pennsylvania Avenue. What could be a major development in the search for missing Alabama teenager. Tonight, a stunning twist in the search for Taylor. Somebody out there knows something. They want to lay him to rest their way, not by somebody else's way.